Mark, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 10. And the King James text today reads, And when they came nigh to Jerusalem, unto Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him, and bring him. But if any man say unto you, Why do, you, why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him. And straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met. And they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. And they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hallelujah. Want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, how quickly we change our minds. Amen. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, Father, once again, God, we come before you humbly as your servants, and God, we make ourselves available to you, Lord, both as the speaker and as the hearer. We submit and surrender ourselves to your spirit. We ask God today that you would anoint the speaker, that you would allow me to declare, thus saith the Lord, to preach the word of God with Holy Ghost boldness. Lord, more than this, that the ear of every hearer might also be touched by the Spirit of the living God, that every hearer, those in this room, those outside of this place, watching and listening by reason of the Internet, Lord, that they would be of a mind and a heart today to receive the Word of God with gladness. Lord, that they might be challenged and changed that their heart might be converted today, Lord, that the sinner might be saved, the backslid might be reclaimed, the sick might be healed, the demoniac delivered. Oh, God, send forth your word at this hour to heal, to deliver, to save. Master, we need you today more than ever before we've needed you. We ask God for your divine hand upon the American elections that are coming up. Lord, others have attempted to interfere with our system in recent years. And we pray, God, that you would intervene and allow your hand, God, to step in at this hour to prevent any such interference in the future. That the will and the mind of the people might be brought to pass. Master, today, we need you today. We need to hear from heaven. We ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. This today is, of course, the passage that one would read for Palm Sunday. And, of course, today is what is commonly referred to as Palm Sunday. Today is the day when we remember the Lord's triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. Just one week before he would rise from the grave. So just a few days prior to his uh, crucifixion, the Lord 
spoke to his disciples and he gave them very specific instructions. He had to be God. He had to be divine. How in the world would the Lord know where a donkey would be tied? Furthermore, how would he know, listen to me now, that that donkey had never been ridden? He wanted a donkey that in terms of being ridden was virgin, that had never been ridden before. No one else had ever ridden on the back of this young donkey. It was not an old goat of a donkey, but a young colt of an ass. And he said, if you go to this specific place, you'll see there's a young colt of an ass tied there and loosen it. If anybody asks you, then here's what you say, the Lord hath need of them. Now, can you imagine somebody coming and appearing to be opening the door to your car and getting ready to drive your car and drive off with it? And you say, hey, what are you doing? And they say, oh, the Lord needs your car. And you just say, oh, okay, <laughs> go ahead, take it. But you see, God is God. God knows the heart of every man. And he knew that when his disciples went to this house and loosed this colt, that that's all the owner of that colt would need to hear to let it go. Let me tell you something, friend. Uh, animals in biblical times were as good as currency. They were valuable. They were important. Uh, animals were used for everything from transportation to plowing the fields. Amen. And of course, different animals, not the cult of an ass, but other animals would be used for food. And so animals were a very important part of the economy in biblical times. And for the owner of this cult to allow that animal to be taken off by strangers, simply with the word spoken, the Lord hath need of him. That must have been one devout, sincere, godly owner. Am I telling the truth? Amen. Amen. But you see, there's another little thing about this story that we don't often think about. If this donkey had never yet been ridden by anyone, how did Jesus get on him and ride him into Jerusalem? Say, well, he just got up on him. They, they threw coats over its back and... Uh, first of all, this was a young colt of an ass. So the chances that this colt was used to carry cargo or was used to transport goods or anything are pretty slim. Generally, you're going to use a full grown, you're going to use an adult ass or an adult donkey, not a young donkey. But you see, there was a prophecy in the Old Testament that the Messiah would ride into Jerusalem on the colt of an ass. Not just on a donkey, but on the colt of an ass. So that's why it was imperative that this be a young colt and not a full-grown donkey. But if no one had ever ridden this colt, how in the world did Jesus ride on the back? You say, well, brother... It's really not that big a thing. Yes, it is. Have you ever tried to get on the back of an ass? Or have you ever tried to get on the back of a horse that have never been ridden before? They're going to buck you every which way but upside down. In order to ride a horse or in order to ride a donkey or a mule, you first have to go through a little process they call breaking it. Am I telling the truth? That's right. You go to a farm, you go to a horse ranch, and honey, they're not going to have you get on the back of an unbroken animal. Uh-uh. No. They're going to have you get on the back of a horse or a donkey, a mule, whatever, that has been broken. They have been ridden by someone who is highly skilled at riding them and is able to hold on and stay on that animal because at first its natural instinct is to buck and try to get that rider off of its back. And that animal's going to go crazy until it either bucks you off or until it finally decides, okay, this isn't so bad, I can live with it. At that point, the animal becomes broken. 
its will, in a sense, has been broken. It has decided that, well, okay, at first I thought this was a bad thing. At first I thought this was a scary thing. But I've come to realize that it's not as bad as I thought it would be. I can handle this. Amen? Isn't it interesting that the same God who could calm the sea with nothing but the word of his mouth could get on the back of a donkey that had not yet been ridden by man. And that donkey never one time bucked. Hallelujah. That donkey never one time tried to reject him. Hallelujah. Oh, there was a miracle in this story that we, didn't, we don't even pay attention to oftentimes. The Lord come into Jerusalem on this pre-Passover uh, day. And he came in to the shouts and to the praise and the adulation of the crowds. The masses gathered along the roads. And they were so thrilled at the Lord coming in that they began to throw palm branches down upon the ground as if to make the way easier for the mule to make his trek down that bumpy, stony, dirty road. And they began to cry out praises. Hosanna! Hosanna to the king. Oh my, what a wonderful, glorious day. This is beyond a doubt the apex of the Lord's ministry. There would never be a day quite like this day. In the 33 and a half years of Jesus' life, in the three and a half years of his public ministry, there would not be another day that would be as wonderful as this day. You notice the picture I've got today that I'm using for my sermon illustration. People gathered, and you can tell whoever they're gathered in front of, they must love. Whoever they're gathered in front of, they must appreciate and they must enjoy because it would appear they're just heaping all kinds of praise. They're heaping all kinds of uh, adulation upon the one we don't see the one that's standing before them, but we know just by the picture has to be something going on they're happy about. Has to be something going on they're glad for. Jesus experienced the most wonderful day in his ministry. The Bible tells us that the people of Jerusalem were worshiping and shouting and making such a noise over the Lord's arrival, listen to me now, because they remembered the things he had done. There were people in that crowd, Johnny, who were there when Lazarus was raised to the dead. At the cry from the Lord's mouth, Lazarus, come forth! There were some in that crowd who no doubt were in nearby ships when the storm was blowing upon them and they heard a faint voice in the darkness cry out, Peace, be still. And all of a sudden the seas calmed and their boats began to slowly stop their bouncing around upon the rough waters. And they looked across and in the breaking moonlight they could see Jesus standing on the bow of his boat with his arms stretched forth. And they knew, oh my, what manner of man is this? <laughs> that even the winds and the seas obey him. There were no doubt some in that crowd who had been there when Jesus got down on one knee and picked up just a little bit of dirt and spit in it mixed it with his finger and then wiped that mixture of spittle mud on the eyes of a blind man only to have that blind man then open his eyes and yell I can see I can see there were those in that crowd who were there that day when beside the pool of Bethesda Jesus asked the lame man Oh, what do you need? What do you, what do you, would you like to walk? Would you, is that what you'd like, is to walk again? 
And that lame man said, I, I don't have anybody, Lord, to put me in the water. When the water is stirred and troubled, I don't have any men to help me. And of course, in my imagination, because I'm so plain spoken, you know, I tend to imagine Jesus being like me a little bit. And look at him and say, uh, that's not what I asked you. Uh, that's not what I asked you. Glory to God. And then the Lord reaches down his hand and grabs that man by one arm and pulls him up to his feet. And suddenly his legs, which have not worked for a lifetime, are strengthened and sturdy and able to support his weight. And he's able to balance. Woo. Those folks have seen a lot. The apostle told us if all the works of Jesus had been written down, he said, I suppose all the books in the world could not contain them. So there was a crowd there, and everybody in that crowd had some kind of an experience with the Lord. Everybody in that crowd had seen God do something marvelous through this man, Jesus Christ. And boy, they were celebrating him. Because obviously, this is no mere mortal man. Obviously, this is not your average Joe. This is someone special. And they were celebrating his arrival for the celebration of Passover in the city of Jerusalem. A few days later, same exact people with the same exact experiences who had seen the same exact things were crying something very different. Suddenly their Hosanna to the King! Oh, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Suddenly those cries were exchanged for Two words, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. In some instances, they were just caught up in the mob mentality. In other instances, people were moved by the priests who had it in for Jesus and who desired to see him dead. The word of God said in Mark, the same book, 14th chapter, just three chapters later, verses 43 through 46. And immediately while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve. Jesus is with the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. And with him a great multitude with swords and staves. My goodness. People traded in their palm branches for swords and staves. From the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss that same as he, take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. Why, it was just a few days ago, you were breaking palms off of trees and throwing the branches upon the ground to make the Lord's entry into Jerusalem. Uh, more spectacular and more comfortable and all of a sudden because the scribes and Pharisees want him dead you suddenly have taken up arms against him how quickly we change our minds mm -hmm. let's go a little further in Mark chapter 15 the next chapter four chapters after the Lord's triumphant entry and Pilate answered and said again unto them, meaning the Jewish people who had gathered around the uh, judgment court, What will ye then that I shall do unto him 
whom ye call, ye call the king of the Jews. <sighs> what shall I do unto him that ye call the king? See, Pilate's reminding them, it wasn't but a few days ago, you were calling him the king. Now what do you want me to do with him? Few days have passed. Now what shall I do with him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! Crucify him! Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him! And so Pilate, willing to contempt the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. How quickly we change our minds. The same people who just a few days earlier, Johnny, a week hadn't even passed, were singing his praises in the streets, making such a noise that the scribes and Pharisees grew frustrated and demanded of Jesus that he silence his followers. And the Lord answered and said, Oh, I won't do that because even if they were to go silent, the rats would begin to cry out, Hallelujah. I got news for you, honey. That was no ordinary man. I've never one time gone to a rock concert where it was the rocks that were doing the singing. Hello now. That's right. My God have mercy. I've never gone anywhere where there were a bunch of rocks in a field and I could hear them praising God or shouting any kind of words of adulation. Never one time. But Jesus said if they were to hold their peace, even the rocks, would cry out, hallelujah, glory to God. I got news for you. The Jehovah's Witnesses may not know who Jesus is, but every rock in Israel does. Hallelujah! Glory to God. They knew he was their creator and not merely one of God's creations. Oh, I want to tell you how quickly we change our minds. Can you imagine what Jesus must have felt like? Bill, looking out over a crowd of faces, screaming, crucify him, crucify him. And being who he was, he recognized every face. He could immediately bring to mind, just three days ago, four days ago, you were singing my praises. Just a few days ago, you were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And now look at you. Now you stand there and you tell Pilate that you would rather have a murderer released back into the public than me. And when Pilate asked, why, what evil has he done? Not one of you, not one of you ever spoke up and said, I saw him heal the blind. I saw him cleanse the leper. I saw him raise the dead. I saw him cause the man who was unable to walk to leap and dance and jump about. Not one of you spoke up in my defense, but instead you cried even louder, crucifying. We talk about the pain that Jesus Christ suffered on the cross of Calvary. But I'm going to tell you, I don't know about you, but I've been in similar places where people who one minute sang my praises, the next day were just running me into the ground. You ever had anybody betray you? You ever had anybody turn their back on you? You ever had somebody change your mind, Johnny? One minute you were just the best guy in the world, the yep. next day you're the biggest jerk that ever lived. Yep. Yep. And when someone says, well, what's so bad about him? All of a sudden, 
They got all kind of bad things to say. But wait a minute, last week you had all, nothing but good to say. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, when you're a pastor, that is something you better get used to fast. You better, if you think you're going to go into ministry, young person, if you think for one minute you're going to go into pastoral ministry, and everybody's going to love you, and everybody's going to think the world of you, and everybody's going to sing your praises, i got news for you. You better think of this one truth, how quickly we change our minds. Because there are going to be people sitting in that church house this Sunday who won't be sitting there next Sunday. And this Sunday, they'll get up in front of everybody and tell the world what a great church it is and what a great pastor you are and how much you've changed their life and how much good you've done for them. And a week from now, you wouldn't get a positive word off their lips about you if you paid them cash money. Yep. I'll tell you a little secret. We talk about the Lord's passion. We talk about the pain and the suffering that he endured. We talk about those things that left physical scars. We talk about the crown of thorns. We talk about the nails through the hands. We talk about the nails through his feet. We talk about the spear in his side. We talk about the beating he took with the cat of nine tails so that he was left with 40 stripes saved one, meaning less one. So 39 stripes. We talk about all the physical pain and agony that Jesus endured, endured on the cross of Calvary. But what about the emotional agony he had to go through before he ever was even scorched? How would you feel? To have one of your closest friends walk up to you and betray you and put you in the hands of the law with nothing but a kiss. A kiss, something that is supposed to symbolize closeness and intimacy, friendship and love. And yet it is with that very act that he betrays you. How would you feel if that were to happen to you today? How would you feel if people who sang your praises today were suddenly crying out for you to experience the worst agony you could possibly experience tomorrow? How would you feel? I can't even imagine the emotional and the psychological agony that Jesus was enduring on that day as he stood before Pilate, long before he was scorched, long before they pulled the hairs of his beard from his face, long before they planted that crown of thorns into his head, already I can only imagine he was heartbroken. Already I can only imagine he was sinking into a deep depression. Already I can imagine he was bewildered and stumped by all these people he had loved and he had helped who suddenly at a moment's notice it seems have changed their minds and everything good they viewed in him yesterday they suddenly no longer see today. How quickly we change our minds tell you there are a lot of Christians in the church today. There are a lot of people in the church today who will live for the Lord for many years. They'll be faithful to the house of God. They'll be part of their local church. They'll be involved. They'll testify. They'll sing in the choir. They'll sing specials. They'll play instruments, not in this church, but in other churches. <laughs> And all of a sudden, something happens. And, Bill, you couldn't pay them enough money to get them into church anymore. Mm -hmm. You couldn't pay them enough money to sing a special. You couldn't pay them enough money to speak a word of testimony, to tell the world about how good living for God is, how quickly we change our minds. Why does this happen? Well, you know, the church 
church has so disappointed me. People have so disappointed me. What a shame. What a shame. You know, I, I read recently on Facebook there was one young man who's part of the LGBT community, and apparently he had experienced something very negative in the church. You know, it happens all the time. We see it all the time. And someone, or more than one, had been very critical and nasty and rude and obnoxious and judgmental. And this young man wrote and said, I'm through with Christianity. Who wants to be part of a religion where people can be like this and blah, 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 blah. And I read his comment. And, and I didn't write anything to him because I don't want to, don't want to add to anything. You know, I don't want to get in, in the muck. I don't want to get in the mud. But I read this comment and I thought to myself, what a sad thing that this is only a religion to you. What a sad thing that Christianity is just a religion to you. It's not about relationship, apparently. He wasn't turning his back on Jesus. He was turning his back on the religion. And I thought, you know, when I was chased out of church, and I'm going to tell you something, honey, the experience I went through would have chased 99.99999% of anybody out of church. What I went through before coming out was one of the most horrific experiences. And, and when I left the church, I told the Lord, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, you will never get me back into a church as long as I live. You, I will never walk back into a church as long as I'm alive. After what's just happened to me, I was humiliated. I was ridiculed. I was cursed and cussed. I was accused of all kinds of hideous things. And oh my goodness, I mean, it was one of the most hurtful, horrendous experiences of my life and yet Johnny my faith in God never changed I didn't stop believing Jesus died on the cross for me and that he rose again on the third day just because the church acted like a bunch of mules I didn't quit believing on the Lord. I didn't start believing this Holy Ghost baptism was a bunch of bunk because a bunch of tongue-talking Christians also use that same tongue to curse and to rebuke and to chastise and to criticize and to condemn me. No! No, I turned my back on the church. I turned my back on the organizations, and I turned my back on the fellowships because they're the ones that hurt me. Jesus didn't. That's right. Amen. right. The Lord never failed me one time. Why in the world would I turn my back on Jesus? Okay. No, Jesus never hurt me one bit. Never will. My God have mercy. I don't understand the mentality how quickly we change our minds. How can you go today from wanting to live for God and wanting to walk in the blessing of fellowship with the Creator and wanting to experience the joys of salvation and the hope of heaven? How can you go from that today to cursing God and claiming He's not real and claiming that the Bible is bunk? How can you do that? How can you make that switch? How in the world is your mind even capable of making such a severe and awkward adjustment? Something was wrong from the get-go. You see, the biggest problem with the people who were shouting when Jesus came into Jerusalem that day Oh, yeah, they were singing his praises. Oh, yeah, they were shouting shouts of adulation. But the biggest problem was, according to the Word of God, the reason behind their shout. The reason they were shouting is because of what they had seen the Lord do. Not because of who the Lord was. Mm-hmm. Oh, my, 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 my. Yeah. 
I'm going to tell you, there are a lot of people in the church, and they're in the church so long as God is doing for them. Oh yeah, as long as they see the blessing of God, as long as they see the Lord doing things for them, they're good. As long as everything's going good, they're good. As long as God is healing and touching and delivering and blessing and providing for them when they need provision, all is well with the world. But they never have yet come to terms with who God is. They haven't yet come to terms with who Jesus is. They have not yet learned to worship him, not because of what he's done, but because of who he is. There's a beautiful song that dates back to the 1980s, and Sandy Patty sang this gorgeous old song. said, Lord, I stand amazed at the wonder of it all. Yet the greater wonder brings me to my knees. Lord, I praise you because of who you are. Not for all the mighty things that you have done. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. It's all the reason that I need to voice my praise. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you something, folks. You're, you can experience a quick mindset change if you worship God because of what God does. But I'm going to tell you, if you ever get it through your head and you know who Jesus is, your mind will be made up, hallelujah, and there won't be anything in this world that will be able to change it. The disciples were sad. They were brokenhearted as Jesus was brought before Pilate. We don't read anywhere that the disciples were in the crowd screaming, crucify him. No, the disciples were not part of that crowd. Their mind hadn't changed. They still believed what they had believed. Why? Because their relationship was with the Lord. And it was based upon his identity, not based upon his works. There you go. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, as we come upon this resurrection season, as we approach the day, my favorite, my favorite holiday of the year is Resurrection Sunday. I, I love it. Some call it Easter. I, I don't like to use that term. It is, in fact, a pagan term. Yes, it is in the Bible, but that is because the Bible is referencing the pagan holiday. <laughs> and uh, it, so just because the word Easter is in the Bible does not mean it's a word that we ought to be using to reference the Lord's resurrection. But I love Resurrection Sunday. I love celebrating the Lord's rising from the dead because I believe every word of it. Why do I believe every word of it? Because I know who Jesus is. Amen. I know what the apostle wrote and he said because it was not possible that death could keep him. Why was it not possible? Because of what Jesus was capable of doing? No, because Jesus was dead. <laughs> It was not possible because of who Jesus was. Hallelujah. The apostle wrote in the New Testament that had the world known who Jesus was. He said they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, I know who Jesus is. My walk with God is based upon who Jesus is. If he never does anything but swing open the pearly gate for me so that I can get into heaven. And by the way, he did that on the cross of Calvary. He opened the gate to the pearly, uh, to the gold city. Amen. Amen. Uh, the word of, there's an old song we used to sing in the church. He, the pearly gates will open. You remember that old song? Open wide that I might enter in. He, the pearly gates, will open. And I'm here to tell you, he already opened the pearly gates on the cross of Calvary as he spoke the words, It is finished! He alerted the angels, Get beside the gates, because in three days, 
I'm going to sound the order. And I expect those gates to open. As I lead captivity captive, I want those doors to open. And on resurrection morning, he, the pearly gates, did open. Hallelujah. And those gates this hour are open to you and I, whether you're straight, gay, cross-eyed, or bow-legged. Those gates are open to you today. If your faith is in him and not in the church. Amen. If your faith is in him and not in the denomination, if your faith is in him and not in some statement of doctrine somewhere, or in some fellowship, or in some conference, or in some convention. And those gates won't ever close. So long as you walk in relationship with him, and your relationship is always based on who he is, Amen. and not what he does. Amen. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there are people that get into relationships even in the flesh, even in human terms. Uh, we get people that get into romantic relationships and, oh, they're just crazy about that person. They, oh, they just think that person is so wonderful. Sure, uh, Bill, because every time you turn around, they're taking you out to dinner and they're buying you something and they're giving you something. Oh, and every time you turn around, there's another gift. Am I telling the truth? But when they lose their job and they have to give their car back because they can't make the payments and they're struggling to pay the rent, all of a sudden they're not as perfect as you thought they were before. <laughs> All of a sudden, they lose their luster. Am I telling the truth? You know why? Because you weren't in love with them. You were in love with what they could do for you. Hello now. Right. Well, I'll tell you, there ain't no love in this world better than when somebody loves you for who you are and not for what you've done or what you can do. You know, some people have a bad habit of doing stuff because they're hoping that that's how they're going to maintain your love. Honey, if you got to do stuff to maintain my love, then you don't want my love. If I've got to do stuff to maintain your love, I don't want your love. Hello now. If I've got to be perfect in order for you to love me. i got news for you, church members. You don't have to be perfect for me to love you. You know, it cracks me up, Johnny. Any number of people over the years have decided they wanted to leave this church and they didn't want to be part of our church anymore. Not one time have I walked out on a church member. I've had some doozies. I've had some real pickles. I've had some who, oh my goodness... They would try your patience at every level. I mean, they were hard to deal with. Oh, my goodness. See, everybody loves to, they get mad at the pastor, and they decide they're going to leave the church. And, and somehow or another, they always think that they're the easiest thing in the world to get along with. They always think that, well, I never have done anything wrong. I've never said anything wrong. I've never approached anything. Oh, no, you have. The only difference is I'm a Christian, and I love you the way I'm supposed to love you, so I've overlooked those things. Yes. There are things about some folks who have been part of our church that drove me up the wall. But you know what? Sometimes Tommy and I after church, we, we'd go out to eat with folks or something. We'd come home and I'd say, and I'm sorry, you, I know some of y'all say, Pastor, I can't believe you said that. But I'm being honest. I, I've told you, I'm a very transparent, very, I've, I've known preachers over the years, every one of them have said things like this about people in the church. But of course they never say it to you, you know. Because they love you and they're trying their hardest. But they'll come home and they'll say to another pastor or they'll say to their wife, you know, Oh dear God, that person just wears me out. Whew. You know what I'm talking about? And we'd come home and I'd say, Oh dear God, you ever notice whenever we go out to eat with that person that the conversation then turns immediately, Johnny. The minute we sit down, the conversation turns to, well, now let me tell you about all the trauma I've been going through. <laughs> and we'd have to sit there for two hours and listen to all the drama. And, and half the drama I couldn't understand 
because it shouldn't have been drama to begin with. If the same exact thing had been said to me, if the same exact thing had been done to me, if the same exact circumstance had been met by me, I wouldn't have had the same response they did. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? You ever heard somebody gripe to you about something at their job, and you're sitting there saying, well, why is that such a big deal to you? What, you know, what, who cares? That, that's not that big a deal. But to them, it was the end of the world. You know, oh, I'll tell you what. And we would have to sit there for hours on end and listen to this person just gripe and groan about everything. As if we were their personal, private support group. And nobody else ever had the floor. <laughs> nobody else ever got to share. It was every, Johnny, every single Time. It was the same thing every single time. Do you know what? Did we stop going to eat with them? Did we discourage them from coming to church? Did we? No. We loved them. We loved them. When they needed help, we helped them. When, when, when something came into their life and they needed a hand, we gave them a hand. We did everything we could. And do you know what? One day they decided, I don't like the way he said this, or I don't like the way he did that, that preacher. And out the door they go in a huff. Never again to tell the world what a wonderful church we are and what a wonderful pastor I am. And it hurts. It hurts. It's hard. Say, how in the world does that person, well, I'll tell you how. Because their relationship with you has always been based on what you could do for them. Listen to me now, not who you are. Because if the relationship with you was based on who you are, see, that's how I approached them. I didn't look at what they did. I looked at who they were. I said, this is a hurting person. This is a struggling person. This is a person who feels the need to air, you know, all this stuff that's going on in their life. And if I've got to help them by listening, then I'll do that. But they don't look at you anymore, Johnny, and say, well, you know, Johnny's a generous person. He's a kind person. He's a compassionate person. He's a hospitable person. He's a charitable person. No, because that would be basing their friendship on who you are, not on what you do. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. Sometimes I wonder, I'll say, Lord... We'll have people, and I'm only using this as an example to illustrate what Jesus went through, okay? I, honestly, that's the only reason I'm talking about these things. The betrayal and, you know. But sometimes people will leave in a huff, and I'll think to myself, Lord, I just told Tommy Saturday, I think it was yesterday, I said, you know what really hurts when people do this sometimes? For year after year after year, we've been friends. We haven't just been pastor and church member. We've been friends. When they, when something happened at the house and there was no heat or the plumbing went bad or something, they could call me and say, Pastor, could, would you mind if we come over and spend the night at your house? And, and we never one time said, oh no, that won't be convenient today. I'm going to tell you a little secret, folks. <laughs> I was born and raised in the Pentecostal movement. I cannot even imagine, literally, I cannot even imagine one pastor I've ever had, including Brother Gillum, inviting me into his house and letting me sleep in his guest room because the heat went out in my house. Now, I think Brother Gump would probably rent me a motel room or something. You know, I, I do think he would do that. But I can't imagine him allowing me to come into his house and stay in his house. You follow what I'm saying? Well, I can't even imagine it. But that's the kind of pastor I've always tried to be. That's the kind of Christian I've always tried to be. I, I want to be there for people. I don't want to... The Bible said that... We're to love not only in word, but in deed. And I want to love in deed. I don't want to just love with words. I want to love in action and in deed. But how painful is it when someone who's not just been just a church member, when you have a church this small, 
we become friends. Right, Johnny? We do. We become friends. We go out to eat. We go to the Chinese place. You know, we go out to eat. We become friends because we know each other too intimately. If we were in a much bigger church and there were a whole lot more people, it'd be a whole lot harder for us to get to know each other as well as we get to know each other. Right. But when you got such a small church, you, be, you tend to become friendly with people. I, God forgive me, but I probably say things to y'all that I shouldn't say as a pastor because I view you as my friends. You know, we're too close. And if our church ever grew to 500 people, I'd probably still confide in you things I wouldn't confide to so, the other 400-something people, right? Right. Because I know you, and we've been together through thick and thin. We've been through all these experiences together, and you know, the whole growth process. So I would approach you differently, because I know you differently. Right. How quickly we change our minds. I'm going to tell you folks, the enemy is constantly warring, the Bible said, against the spirit of our mind. The enemy is constantly warring against our minds. He wants you to turn against God. He wants you to turn against the church. He wants you to turn against everything that is going to benefit you and help you in your walk with God and in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Remember this the next time you are thinking of changing your mind at a moment's notice. Remember this, the enemy wants you to do that. He wants you suddenly, impulsively, quickly to have a change of heart and to no longer see the pastor as a friend or to no longer see the church as beneficial or to no longer see your walk with God as being a good way of life. Hello? That's right. Amen. That's right. Oh, I want to tell you, don't be one of those today who cries out, Hosanna! Glory to God in the highest. And then tomorrow who is crying, crucify him. Don't be one of those people, folks. Don't let the enemy win. The word of God tells us this in closing today in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. And this is my final word. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Hmm. Isn't that what Jesus seemed to go through? Yes. Seemed like by the time it was all over, there wasn't nobody liked him anymore. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Amen. You got to... I always refer to old songs because I know more old songs than Carter has liver pills. There's an old song that says, I got my foot on the rock and my mind's made up. Though I walk through the lonesome valley, though I drink from a bitter cup, when the devil comes a knocking, showing me an easy way, I look him right square in the eye and this is what I say. I got my foot on the rock and my mind's made up. Hallelujah. I got my foot on the rock and my mind's made up. I don't plan on changing my mind, devil. I don't care what the church does. I don't care what Trump does. I don't care what fundamentalists do. I don't care what's going on in the world. I don't care how Christians behave. My relationship is with Jesus. It is based on who he is. Amen. And not what he's done or what he does. And I will not be soon changing my mind. Would you stand Amen. with me this afternoon? Hallelujah.